Welcome back, everyone. Anna, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Katharina, thanks for organizing this, facilitating this. Um, I have a cold, so you've probably, probably already heard me coughing through um, then responding to the questions. That was not necessarily my comments, although some of them were also my comments. Um, so one problem is that I'm harder to understand how I have a cold. The other problem is that I'm having more trouble understanding myself because there's some things happening between where I speak and where I hear, so I sound very weird to myself. Um, thirdly, I kicked out some of the slides where I was going to say something conceptually about financialization because of like, well, we've had also discussions, so I want to skip that. But now that Ben has done it, um, I feel that I have to do it a little bit. So I'm going to draw a little bit here. Um, and I'll start not with financialization, I'll start with something that Ben said in the beginning. You could say, like, well, the social is in here and the economic is within the social, right? This is basically how we could summarize the very beginning of his talk. This fits very well with how I was trained originally as a sociologist, um, where we always said the economic is part of the social, so is the cultural, so is the political, and so are many other things. They're all part of the social, right? So you would say this is um, an approach we could share within many of the social sciences. We could agree that many of those things are embedded. But then we come to financialization, and then Ben tells us we have interest bearing capital, which leads to consequences for corporations which leads us to more general economic consequences, which leads to more social consequences. So all of a sudden, the interest-bearing capital and the social are very far apart, and the one only has consequences <laughs> for the other one. So by his definition, the one of Epstein, he was saying this is a very fussy one. Um, my definition is actually an adopted one of the one of Epstein, which is perhaps even fuzzier ones. I also include the narratives in there. And I think it's very important to keep the narratives in there, because I don't think the interest-bearing uh, capital is going through all these arrows and then having an, an effect on the narratives. I think the narratives are actually part of what makes it possible to have financialization in the first place. So I don't think something like a narrative is an outcome of financialization. I think it's an important uh, foundational element of financialization. So for me, financialization has to include all these different elements. I totally agree that it's a very fuzzy concept. Um, in a response to a critique of financialization in 2015, I've also written as much as I said, I totally uh, accept that critique. Yet, I think it is necessary to have a concept that is so wide ranging because reality is so complex and we cannot simply take a narrative or something social as an outcome purely of something like interest bearing capital or any other reduction of financialization. So, I think if you want to keep together the analysis, of all these different levels, because you look at financialization of households, the financialization of big corporations, I don't think they're separate. And I don't think the financialization of big corporations is the cause of the financialization of the households necessarily. I think these things are all interrelated at a very, uh, in a very different way, where the one is not just an outcome of the other one. And this means that, yes, sometimes financialization is mobilized uh, as, a, as an exponent, sometimes as an exponendum the thing that explains or the things that, that is being explained, and I think it couldn't be any other way. Um, so this, in this sense, financialization shares that idea with globalization or neoliberalization, heavily critiqued concepts for good reasons, but it's very difficult to do without them. There's also people who said we should reduce financialization to one thing, and then for the other thing we call asetization, which again I think is valid in the critique that yes, some of these are different things, but by putting them apart conceptually, we actually split what makes financialization such an interesting thing that it brings together introducts economists, anthropologists, geographers, sociologists, literary scientists. There's very interesting studies about how TV shows these days or novels these days have included this financial narrative. So when I talk about financial narratives, I'm not just talking about Wall Street. I'm talking about people in their daily lives speaking in a financialized language. So there's literally scholars, cultural studies scholars who've looked at this, and they're not just looking at this. They are actually looking at what makes this possible to have these narratives. So for that reason, I think we cannot separate them conceptually, but I think we can separate <coughs> them uh, operationally. So what we're actually doing this talk is in that way not as radically different from Ben's idea of financialization as I just suggested, because I will talk about monetary policies also to some extent and some of the effects of it. So in a way, I will fall something like this, but I'm not saying conceptually it can be reduced to that. So that's an important difference between what I argue uh, and empirically what I present. Because I think the fact that financialization is conceptually very complicated and going in all kinds of directions and happening at different scales means that uh, empirically speaking, operationally speaking, we have to have different operational definitions to look at different elements of it. 
So it's great if you can have a project where you can have different disciplines work together as you have had here. Uh, because I think it's the only possible way actually to look at financialization before. And even that's difficult. So um, I didn't want to do another uh, talk about the financialization of housing in general, uh, which I've done many times, and some of you might have been in Lisbon exactly 50 days ago when I was doing a similar talk. I know at least one person was. <laughs> uh, so only the first part of my talk will be a very fast overview of, of what financialization of housing has looked at. And I do that basically mostly in the first two papers. The first one is an introduction to a special issue I've done where we had papers uh, discussing the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, UK, US, and Brazil. Uh, see, I think I have one country too many there. There's probably no UK there. No, no UK, but still US and Brazil. So also one global South country. And this is a, a literature review that I was invited to do. Uh, which looks very much at financialization, although it's a bit wider defined. But most of the second part of the talk uh, will be based on a paper that has just been accepted a few weeks ago uh, for a special issue in housing policy debate about financialization in the global south. So when I talk about semi-periveries, I don't talk about what in this room is usually understood as a semi-periphery, which could be the Mediterranean, or you could say the Mediterranean and parts of Eastern Europe. In a global scale, I think for many people elsewhere in the world, this would still be the core. Maybe it would be the semi-core, but I don't think it would be the semi-periphery if you come from many other places in the world. So the semi-periphery I think of is actually middle-income countries in the global south. Global south, again, is a problematic concept, but it's sometimes it's useful to use it because otherwise we need many more words. Um, so I'm thinking of middle-income countries like many we find in Latin America, uh, some that we find in Southeast Asia, but for instance also the Middle East. So my story works quite well for Brazil. And I know in Portugal people are usually quite well informed about a situation in Brazil, so I'm using Brazil as an illustration um, as of part of my arguments. But it could also apply very well to a place like Turkey, for instance. It doesn't apply very well to much poorer countries, so it doesn't apply to the periphery of the periphery, you could say. But sort of middle-income countries, and if we think of some Latin American countries, um, I just came back from Chile, which is richer in the per capita income than most East European countries. So if we think of those countries as poor and we think of Europe as rich, that's quite problematic uh, because Chilean income per capita is much closer, say, to Portugal than it is to much poor countries, for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So in that sense, we could say, well, maybe they're all semi-peripheries. Uh, other people make the argument most countries in the world are now middle-income countries. So to speak of something as north and south or rich versus poor is, is inherently problematic. But I will still do it at some point, because it's hard to do. So, the many presentations, <laughs> I like to start with this graph about the financialization of housing. So some of you have might see it. It's made by a colleague in the French-speaking University of uh, Brussels, uh, Alice Romainville, comes from our PhD thesis. That I was invited to be a jury member of, but the whole thesis was in French. And now I can read a little French, but 400 pages in French is too much. Uh, but I um, pushed her also to do an article in, in uh, English, which she did. Uh, so this graph is in there, and it basically shows a very simple picture, index numbers uh, we have here. So 100 means something stays stable over time, and we see the little axis for average household income. Uh, so basically for the region of Brussels, this is not the city of Brussels, but the region of Brussels, uh, this is more or less stable. We see it going up a little bit, and at some point it actually goes down a little bit again. And then we see the little squares, average selling price of dwellings. Um, and we see that basically doubling in a very short period of time and then stabilizing again. You can make a graph like this, very similar for more than 90% of the cities in the world. So not 19, but 90. Um, the timing would look a little bit different. In some places in the world, the income may actually go up a little bit more. It may go from 100 to 120 or 100 to 30. In Brussels, it does not. People think Brussels is a rich city. It's relatively poor, unemployment rates uh, used to be 24% when I moved there seven years ago. It's now only 18%. So this is very much in a way a city like we have many of them in Southern Europe. Average income is also comparable to many places outside the capital regions in Southern Europe. Um, so this is something about Brussels, but this graph could be made about many other cities. The period in which this movement happens is not the same everywhere. But again, if we would move the years, you could make a very similar graph for, for places around the world. So what typically happens, people will say, like, well, we have to understand Brussels. There we have, we have to understand Belgium to explain what's going on. My argument has been for a number of years, if we want to understand something like this, and the fact that it happens in most cities around the world, 
Yes, we have to understand that city. Yes, we have to understand that country, but we also have to understand something that happens at a more global level. Because the, the, this, this price increase happening in Brussels is not uh, disconnected from wider trends in the global economy. It doesn't mean that they can be reduced to it. So this is, as I already said, we see this anywhere around the globe. I forgot that I put this fancy thing in. <laughs> Um, so, 10 years ago, financialization of housing was a very niche topic. I wrote my first paper about it uh, 12 years ago, got published 11 years ago. So, I wrote it in New York as the crisis was unfolding. It was a very interesting period of time. Um, and people thought it was very odd. At the same time, I defended a research proposal about financialization of housing for a Dutch research council. And they said, like, well, but once this crisis is over, what are you going to do? Because people will stop talking about this. And I'm like, what crisis is over? Like, it hasn't even started in the Netherlands yet. This was, you know, beginning of 2008 when I pro uh, defended the proposal. When in Europe, there was still the schadenfreude of, like, the stupid Americans with their wild west capitalism. We've done much better. <laughs> there's books that argue as much. Uh, there's a book from a former Belgian prime minister, now uh, quite high up in the European uh, Union, who has argued basically exactly that. And then the crisis came to Europe. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, a lot of it has been picked up about financialization of housing by very different groups. So we have activist group, and I see one of the people here represented who's behind this report, uh, picking up on the financialization of housing. Uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to housing, that go only based in Brazil, uh, picked it up some years ago also. The new UN Rapporteur on housing, based in Canada, also picked it up. Here's her last name, Lailani Farah. Uh, pretty sure it's Portuguese roots. It's not weird for someone from Toronto. Uh, the European Commission has organized a workshop together with the city of Amsterdam, also talking about EU cities and the financialization of housing. So this is just an overview of what's happening. There's much more. And this is all from the last two years. So within a very brief period of time, it's being picked up much and much. Uh, so what we very often see in the literature coming from places anywhere often but the US is that people say, well, we have no subprime uh, lending in my country, so there's no financialization. I don't think subprime lending is financialization to begin with, uh, although it's, it could definitely be furthered by financialization. But this is an argument we often see. Then there's another one that says, uh, we have no securitization in my country, so therefore there's no financialization. Uh, people also say, like, ah, there's no REITs, or REITs have been introduced very uh, recently, real estate investment trusts, so we don't have any of those, so there's no financialization. Or it's happening to the state, which is another popular one, so it's no financialization. Just like neoliberalism is often happening to the state, we could argue the same about financialization. Um, so this is often a very simplified argument that comes from any peripheries or any semi-peripheries. And I think this is problematic because what it does is it always compares countries to some sort of idea of what the West is, or the global north, or the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, in Latin America, it's often the only comparison is the US. So people say, we're not like the US, so therefore we don't have financialization. Uh, some of the most pronounced examples of financialization in an urban context, not just housing, but more widely defined, happen actually in Brazil. Um, but since it's not like the US, people say it's not the same. Another argument, um, for instance, in Brazil is being made, we introduced real estate investment trust very late, so therefore it's not financialization. We are very much behind. Actually, Brazil was much earlier with the introduction of real estate investment trusts in many European countries. Um, so there's always this comparing. In Europe, uh, and in Asia, the comparison is often not just to the US, but also to the UK. And then for the fact that something is different than the UK or the US, it's like, well, therefore, we're not like the West or the North. But so it's very problematic, I think, to reduce also the idea of that there's a dominant model to these two countries, um, which in themselves are quite exceptional. The US to a further degree than the UK. Um, so this is, this is problematic. The other thing is I think that it's important to keep a focus on what the noun subject of Asian in the term financialization means. So it's an action or a process. So it's not just about money or finance being present, it's about uh, a furthering of that process um, to which that happens. So this is where I before had more conceptual slides about financialization, which I kicked out now to focus a little bit more on the comparative analysis of financialization of housing. So what I'm not arguing that this is the same around the globe. Uh, I've been cited in a paper where I argued that there's further, further divergence of housing systems. And I've been cited for arguing that I argued there's more convergence because I compare countries. And what I'm arguing is that some of the trends go in the same direction, but don't necessarily lead to convergence. And I will give you a visual illustration of that very soon to make it a little bit easier to understand. What I'm 
is saying that things are comparable. You can compare things without saying that they are the same. I think this is one of the problems that, especially within my discipline, geography is very common now. Everything is about difference, and I think difference is very important. It doesn't mean we can't compare. It doesn't mean that some things don't happen on a higher scale. Um, so yes, is the financialization housing of housing different in the periphery or in the semi-periphery? Definitely, because it's different in every single place. It's not just different in Portugal from the UK. It's also different in the Netherlands from the UK, which are equally comparable countries in terms of development and all kinds of other things. And in some ways, the Netherlands is more financial than the UK, and in some ways less. Um, so it's not just that you can compare it to this one country. They're all different. So the semi-periphery will be different for sure. The question is, in what way is it specifically different? Is there something also that these countries have in common? And in this sense, when I talk about the semi-periphery, I mean not so much what I have called the semi-core before, some in Europe, but it's much more these middle-income countries outside Europe. Um, so how can we explain parallel developments in housing and finance in these different countries, and how do they relate to the development in core countries? Not saying that these are the same in those countries, but there might be a relationship that causes the difference. Um, so financialization of housing, to not put it in, in very precise terms, but still have a little bit, say a little bit about what it could mean, is that it suggests that housing is increasingly becoming more dependent on finance. So not just interest bearing capital, but finance more generally speaking. It doesn't mean that housing is completely or only related to finance. There was a very interesting paper a few months ago in the planning journal that argued against the financialization of the city by saying, local policies are still important, therefore it's not financialization. There's no one in the financialization literature that writes about the city that says that local policies are not important. They often say local policies change through financialization rather than saying that they're not important anymore. So, but this is a very popular argument. People say, ah, it's not completely financialized, so therefore there's no financialization. The other thing that I already mentioned when I talked a little bit about these things here is that this is about different processes located at multiple scales. So it's not just that we can go from one scale and then analyze the other ones. We have to look at all the scales all the time and connect in different directions, not just from the global to the local, but also the other way around. And we can't do, I think, of this at the same time empirically speaking, but conceptually this is necessary. Uh, this means that it's not easy or necessary to study financialization in its totality. We are forced, empirically speaking, to look at small parts of it. It also means that, empirically speaking, financialization may happen in some domains, but happen alongside non-financialization in other domains. The fact that we see financialization there doesn't mean that everything is financialized. So we can talk about varied, variegated financialization, as Ben also did, and as you saw one of the papers I put up the title before when I talked about variegated financialization. And in the paper with Rodrigo Fernandez that I mentioned that I will do part of this talk when we talk about uneven and combined financialization, but we did it quite loosely. So. Another graph that I didn't make, but that I think shows quite nicely what happens to what banks do in 17 OECD countries, so 17 rich countries, or as the economist likes to say, uh, a club of rich countries and Chile. <coughs> um, and what we see here are the numbers from 1870 to 2010. I'm not very good in working with big data sets, but I'm not a social scientist who looks down on other people doing it. So I'm very happy if other people who are good at it do it. So I'm very happy that these uh, people at Federal Reserve are associated with it in the US did so. And what they basically show is if you just look at the blue line, we see no mortgage lending. And we see that although it goes up uh, compared to the size of the economy, um, it actually doesn't go up that fast, although if you see in the periods from 1870 to the First World War, it still more or less doubles compared to the size of the economy. The First World War doesn't have a huge impact. The Second World War has a huge impact, so does the crisis of the 30s. Uh, and then it goes steadily up, up, up. It basically takes up till the late 70s, till it's back on the level of the 1910s and 1920s, right? Um, so then from the 1980s onwards, we see with some ups and downs, it increases further, but not spectacularly so. If I we start looking at mortgage lending, so this is only mortgage lending, this is widely defined. So in some countries, the legal thing might not be a mortgage, but it might still be lending uh, meant to buy real estate. So that's what we included here. But all kinds of other loans, car loans, student loans, loans to corporations, uh, loans to governments, all of these things are all the blue line. So only lending meant for real estate is in here. Uh, and I don't think it includes lending in commercial real estate, only residential real estate. So we basically see these lines are tracking each other. The First World War has a huge impact on mortgage lending, uh, which in a way is odd because many of those countries were not even in the First World War. Uh, it goes up again, and by the 
before the Second World War, it's basically back on the trend line. The Second World War has a huge impact, but for a short period of time, there's more markets landing than there's no markets landing. I think some economic historians should write something about this and about this, which would be interesting studies possible there. And then we see again the two lines are tracing each other, and something starts to happen around 1980. Um, so we said neoliberalism four decades, well, that's roughly around that time, right? So we see the line of market setting going up much and much cheaper than the other line. And by early 1990s, for this average of the 17 countries, there is now more market setting than all the other forms of lending combined. Then this is the crisis of 2007, 2009. It's this little blip in the picture. Uh, and for many of these 17 countries, we of course know the numbers after 2010. And the red line is either stable or going up. More importantly, for many countries, not including here, this is exactly where most of the growth in market lending takes place. After 2010 is where that red line goes up in most countries. In the, in the paper, they also have graphs for the different countries. And for the UK, you can actually see one year after the election of Margaret Thatcher, you can see the red line making a little thing where it goes up. <coughs> in other countries, it's not as clear to make a, make a connection between one person being elected and the red line changing. For the UK, you can, for other lines, it's a bit, bit blurrier. So, what this basically shows is that banks are in the business of lending on real estate, everything else is secondary. Ben was saying mortgage lending is not necessarily financialization. I'm not saying it necessarily is, but if we define uh, it as interest bearing capital financialization, well, mortgage lending is based on interest bearing capital, right? So, in that sense, actually, I think it might be financialization. Um, but we can see here, if people argue, like, oh, this is reduced just to uh, Western Europe or to North America, actually, um, I mean, even falling off the, the screen here, for any place in the world, we have plenty of references actually showing that this is taking place. So this is not happening just in one place, this is happening across the world. And what I think is going on here is, uh, you could say, the reversed version of scenario number two. This is what I meant with... The trends are going in the same direction, but actually they are divergent. So what I think if you compare many countries, is actually two lines going up. And for instance, if this would be market steps for one country, they might go up a little bit like this, and the other one starting at a higher point going up even steeper. You could, for instance, do Portugal, it goes up, and you do the line that starts higher, it goes up even steeper. So the levels in Portugal, in the sense of market steps, grow apart over time, but they undergo the same trend. So because of that, I'm saying, yes, there is divergence, not convergence. But the Netherlands and Portugal are undergoing a common trajectory. They are both in a situation where mortgage finance becomes more important over time. And even though the Netherlands was always more dependent on mortgage finance than Portugal, and mortgage lending in the Netherlands has grown uh, much more, it's, it's together with Norway, it's probably the most mortgage country in the whole world. Um, Portugal has grown too, but not at the same extent. So these two lines are going like this meaning that they undergo a common trajectory of the increasing uh, mortgageization, you could say, of, of, uh, of housing. So this is what we see between many countries if we compare them. Yes, they, they, are, they were always different, they stay different over time, but the trend goes in the same direction. So this is a picture from Colin Hay, uh, political scientist or political economist. Uh, and he's saying if we just talk about convergence and divergence, it actually blurs, because we actually have, often have common trajectories. So he says it's much more interesting to look at these common trajectories than only at a divergence or convergence. So mortgage debt is only part of the story. I recently got a paper rejected which was uh, on rental housing and the referee wrote one paragraph rejecting the paper saying uh, financialization is not just about mortgage debt and explained that in a few more lines and then rejected the paper while the whole paper was about rental housing. So I'm pretty sure the referee didn't read the paper quite well and didn't like the idea <laughs> that I talked about financialization in housing. Uh, so here we see what also happens. So in places like the Netherlands and the UK, we have housing associations who actually use derivatives. Uh, so the use of derivatives, I think, is something Ben and I could agree on that would be a form of financialization of housing. What we also see is private equity and hedge funds buying up entire social housing companies. So many of those uh, funds, of course, do it with borrowed capital, so interest-bearing capital. Um, so they don't have a lot of capital in store. They borrow the money and then buy up thousands of units. And this happens most pronouncedly uh, in places like Germany, uh, Spain, I could have mentioned here as well. Um, but also the UK and New York City. In the UK it's to a much smaller degree. New York City is an important one. And very often it's not private rental housing per se that they buy up, 
that either subsidized housing or rent stabilized housing is in the case of New York so often not fully commodified housing that they buy up. So the commodification happens here through financialization. While well, you could say in some other countries we have commodification first and then perhaps afterwards we have a phase of financialization. In these cases you have them together. The one makes the other one possible. Financialization enabling commodification. Um, and it's interesting that Germany and Spain within Europe are the two prime examples of this because their housing markets couldn't be more different. The German housing market is, used to be very stable until five years ago. Price increases were very limited. When I talked about 90% of the cities, I was excluding the 10% where a lot of uh, German cities were in there. Germany was barely hit the housing market by the crisis of 2007. Spain was very hard hit. Uh, but in Spain and Germany, these are the two countries where in Europe this happens the most. And in one, it's, it's, it's for opposite reasons that then almost become the same. In Germany, it's actually because German housing was undervalued and it was relatively cheap, therefore, to buy up. In Spain, because so many people could no longer pay, up, uh, pay for their mortgages, a lot of more housing became available to buy up by these organizations. And then um, they could rent out partly to people who used to be homeowners before. Um, so you get a very similar model of how to use the model of Wall Street or the city of London to run a housing company being implemented into countries within Europe that couldn't be more different. We also see publicly listed real estate companies. These are often seen together as one thing, but I think it's important to separate them. And these can be real estate investment trusts that I mentioned before. They could have other legal status. Um, and they are doing a lot of the same things as the private equity and hedge funds, but these private equity Private equity and hedge funds are in it for the short run. They buy up the housing with the idea that it's undervalued, they resell it again after a few years, after restructuring the company, loaning it with debt, as these companies tend to do. While these REITs tend to be it with the idea that they can actually make money on housing in the long run. So there's problems with each of these models, but some of the problems that are here are also there, but not all the problems that are here are here, because they're actually interested in renting out housing for longer periods of time. In fact, what often happens is that some of these companies here transform their housing portfolios into real estate investment trusts. So I wrote about that quite a bit uh, in Germany together with uh, a former PhD student of mine, Katjan Leiber, who is now assistant professor in Utrecht. So in Germany, we looked at some of the biggest transactions that you can see here. Uh, so this is all, uh, the smallest one here is 11,000 units, the biggest transaction here, where is it? Uh, it's here 93,000 units. So this happened throughout Germany. And these transactions of housing being either owned publicly or by non-profit, the, the commodification by financialization in Germany uh, involved more units than the right to buy in the UK. So the right to buy in the UK is always the frame of reference for commodification of housing. What happened in Germany in just 10 years' time rather than 30 years' time involved more housing units than it involved in the UK. So actually this is, in that sense, a bigger example. So in blue you see either public ownership or we're cheating here a little bit, as I said, some of it is non-profit. In green we see uh, the private equity and hedge funds coming in. So this is a time scale, 97 years, 2003, and at the end of 2015. And in purple we see these real estate investment trusts or other companies that are run like real estate investment trusts that are technically, or legally I should say, not real estate investment trusts. So you can see the shift very well over time, and you can see that this capital is the city of London and Wall Street, although sometimes being backed up again by pension funds. Probably the pension funds from when I was still working in Amsterdam has been doing some of this because it's one of the biggest in the world. But then some of them also being backed up by Deutsche Bank, uh, but by Deutsche Bank London, not by Deutsche Bank Frankfurt. So we see a lot of these same companies there. And I want to get to another part of the talk, so I will skip this part where it shows where the REITs are around the world, although you can see that actually Brazil 93 is here relatively early because most of Europe is doing it only in the 2000s. And so I'm trying to combine different ideas that have been developed uh, about how to understand differences between places and even in combined development. I don't say much about corporate here, but in the paper I say a little bit more about it. Hierarchies of money uh, and also dependent on subordinated financialization. I don't try to keep them apart and saying which of these perspectives is better. I'm trying to pick and choose quite selectively without taking one way and saying this is the only way to do it. So I want to replace methodological naturalism here by a relational approach, which again is not convergence. Um, I usually say that five or six times because often there's still someone who says, but you say there's convergence. Um, so on even like combined development. Of course, Trotsky, as most of you will know, developed this idea to say how can we explain the Russian Revolution? Why would that take place? 
in a place where we think it shouldn't take place according to Marxist theory. So then the basic idea becomes that capitalism is spatially variegated, leading to a process of uneven development across and within countries. And I'll go to this quite quickly. The practice of financialization therefore can coexist in a non-financialized institutional environment as a result of cross-border interlinkages that in time have broader implications for domestic political economies. In other words, it can start very selectively in one part of the economy and then uh, spread out, although it doesn't necessarily do so. This also has to do with external practices, uh, pressures. For instance, the World Bank's agenda to maximize finance for development is very much not just pushing finance, but is pushing financialization as a technique also on developing countries. Uh, so we see islands of highly advanced practices of financialization, sometimes in a sea of, of otherwise a non-financialized economy. Sometimes if you look at national figures of an economy, it's very hard to trace the financialization in the global south. But if you look at very specific uh, techniques, you can see the financialization, which then can explain how in later years it can sometimes uh, develop so fast. But one thing that's being often overlooked in these debates about periphery, semi-periphery, uneven development, uh, suburban financialization, is the idea of the hierarchies of money. Uh, especially in my discipline, again, geography, we don't like to speak about hierarchies. It's all about relations. Um, but the hierarchy, I would say, is a form of relation. So, Cohen talked about the geography of money. Uh, he didn't talk about geography much in geographical terms, but it was basically the hierarchy he was discussing. So, we have a number of currencies that are considered the top currencies in the world, and I've listed them here, they will be familiar to you. Um, so, in that sense, Portugal is, you could say, very much in the core and not in the periphery. Although, within the core, it could be a sort of periphery, but it would be a periphery within the core rather than the periphery outside the core, I would say. Um, but what it means is that if you have one of those currencies, it becomes far more difficult to sell domestic bonds to foreign investors than in other currencies. Um, we've seen this effect very strongly in the years before the crisis, but also interestingly after the crisis, after the first panic about Greece is over. Actually, it's not so hard anymore for Greece now to, to sell new ones. Uh, the story a few years ago was that Greece couldn't do it anymore. Everyone wanted German bonds. Greek bonds are quite popular again, and the interest rates on them are extremely low. Um, so this becomes very difficult for countries with other currencies and for very low income countries it even becomes impossible to basically use their own currency. So you get what Keynes calls the transfer problem, the debt is denominated in a foreign currency that then generates a reliance on the liquidity conditions in other countries. So we get a currency met match exports and you have to expand exports in order to receive payments in foreign currencies to pay off your debts. This is often being discussed as a problem for governments but it could equally be a problem for private bonds, it could even be a problem also for households that in many countries are having a mortgage loan denominated in a currency that's not their own. So we can say how do the financial crisis and this hierarchy of money shape subordinate financialization? Well, I'm relying on some ideas of other people here, but as I say, I'm not taking the theory all the way. I'm trying to combine it with some, some of the other ones. So, after the year 2000, we see net financial movements have been flowing uphill, meaning from the periphery to the core. And the impact of the financial crisis has been, as this literature has shown, that this flow has accelerated. Um, even more money is flowing from the periphery to the core. One consequence of this, it becomes far more difficult to sell domestic bonds to foreign investors in other currencies. Um, this has all been shown, I'm not going to discuss it in detail, I want to move on to where it touches housing. Uh, we see a decline in cross-border lending actually as a result of this, so bank lending across borders is decreasing, so you could say a deglobalization in some way, but there's an increase in international bond markets, so the capital markets become more important than banking. Um, what we also see in this same period is loose monetary policies like quantitative easing in the poor countries, injecting 12 trillion dollars into the global financial system in just 10 years time. Uh, so this is a massive amount of money, and this is mostly the ECB and the Federal Reserve, but the Bank of England as well, and also the Swiss National Bank. Um, and what we see here is partly a result of this, it's not only cost, but this is one thing. International bonds in Latin America and Asia are increasing rapidly. So we have also a picture here of these international bonds and how they increase. Uh, again, in the year 2000, so these are index numbers, it doesn't mean <laughs> uh, that the absolute relations necessarily change between these countries because they're all relative to their own region, right? So we see here the increase in bonds from the year 2000 in developed countries is very high, but then we see in Asia Pacific, they already start going up as well, but then 
in the crisis, when they start stabilizing in developed countries, they start going up further in, uh, in the Asia and Pacific region. And in Latin America, they only start to go up basically from 2009 onwards. Um, so this is one of the effects um, of the crisis combined with quantitative easing. And what is important here uh, is actually the World Bank is, is seeing this. So the World Bank is doing many bad things. But interestingly enough, their reports are often full of a lot of interesting analysis that I do share. So here's what they say. Maybe you read it for yourself so I can read some more. Yeah, so my graph on the last slide was already suggesting this a little bit. But what is important is this increase in the international bond market, so the capital market, is not primarily in government bonds. This is something that's not as stressed as much in the last month, but it's in private bonds. So that means you get foreign liquidity into your system. Which means that it's actually financing non-financial corporations in the periphery, not necessarily financial institutions. There's other research that shows that a lot of it goes to non-financial corporations. But they're getting a lot of liquidity. So it's not just banks becoming bigger, it's money being pumped into non-financial corporations that don't necessarily have a lot of growth. So those companies might be growing with a few percent per year, but the amount of money that goes into those companies is growing much faster. So this is what some people call the financialization of non-financial corporations, NFCs. To use acronyms, this guy in the room, he likes acronyms. Um, so, what this does through a very uh, complicated process is that at some point you have too much money coming in. In Brazil they realized this rather quickly, in Turkey a little later. And so, the central banks in these countries want to take the money out of circulation because it's uh, inflating the money that goes around uh, the economy without actually leading to a lot of economic growth. So, if all this money being invested in the global south would lead to economic growth, probably everyone would be happy. But it doesn't lead necessarily to economic growth, it just leads to bigger balance sheets for non-financial corporations in these countries. So central banks in some of these countries, and Brazil was quite early, realized this, and they want to take the money out of circulation, which they call sterilization. It's an interesting metaphor, I think, uh, which we could dwell upon for 40 minutes as well. So they want to reduce liquidity in the market, right? Uh, neoclassical economists always talk about liquidity being the most important thing. In this case, the central banks want to take liquidity out of the market. What, of course, is another risk, if you have the end of quantitative easing, the flows may actually reverse. So if these companies have become very dependent on uh, money flowing in from the global north to the global south, once the flows reverse, they might be so addicted to the money that they can't do their business anymore without it. We already see the effects in Turkey of this in the last few years, uh, but this may happen in other countries as well. So here we see a total reserve to central banks because they try to take out this money out of circulation. So it's not just me saying it, it's the numbers backing it up for some countries. So you see for Brazil, you can see it extremely well. From already before the crisis onwards, they start to take money out of circulation by putting it on their own books. So by taking it off the books of the, the corporations, the non-financial corporations, it goes into the reserves of the central banks, which seems like a nice thing. They have more reserves, but it could be quite problematic as well. So Brazil is an extreme example here, but you see Thailand and Indonesia, the lines don't look as spectacular, but if you see from how low they get here, it's still a massive increase that we see. We see for Chile, we see a little bit of it that doesn't work as well. Also for South Africa, that comes from almost zero. It doesn't seem as spectacular, but actually increases quite a bit. Uh, so here are just a number of countries in different continents to, to illustrate the argument, but also to say why it works better for Brazil. So this is a summary of what I've been saying in the last five years. Uh, the problem of this summary is that it suggests these are all causal links where the one uh, causes the next thing. There should be all kinds of arrows and all kinds of other directions around here. So I'm not presenting this as saying like this is exactly what happens. I'm trying to simplify part of my argument by making it look like this. Uh, so it's a little easier, hopefully, to follow why one step leads to the next one. Uh, especially since myself, I'm also not trained as an economist. Uh, it was very necessary for me also, for myself to make it like this to, want to be able to understand what's going on. Um, so I'm not going to repeat this completely, you probably already read part of it. I've said it in the last few minutes. Um, if you want afterwards, I can send the slides also, because uh, I also am aware that my time slowly will be running out. Um, so this is, in a way, the simplified view, which is oversimplified, I fully admit it. 
Um, so what is important here? As I already said, it is not just that governments borrow in the currency of other countries. I show that it's true also for private companies, but it's also true for market stocks. And this happened already in the late 20th century in many South European countries. I don't know to what extent it happened in Portugal. I lived in Italy one year, I speak a little Italian, so I know the Italian situation much better. In Italy this happened quite a lot, and it was often in Denmark, so in, in, uh, in German, in the German currency before the Euro. And a lot of people uh, at some point lost their home, because what happens? Uh, because they borrowed in Denmark, the interest rate is much lower. Most of what you pay in your mortgage loan is, even when the interest rate is low, is interest rather than paying off the principal. So it really helps to have a lower interest rate. But then, if the currency difference between the Denmark and the Italian lira becomes bigger, it means that you need to pay more money in Denmark. Uh, because for the wages you get in Italian lira, you can't uh, pay as much anymore, so you need to come up with more lira to be able to pay off your, your loan. So, some of you in Portugal uh, may be uh, familiar with this. It's, it happened in many Southern European countries. Then the same started happening in Eastern Central Europe. Uh, years ago I had a Polish girlfriend and her sister was having one of these mortgages to buy a house. And I told her, don't do this, because <laughs> if the slotty goes down uh, and uh, the Swiss franc goes up, because they didn't do it in the Euro, they did it in the Swiss franc, which makes it even riskier. Um, you can lose your apartment. Uh, and many people in Poland lost their apartment, many people in Hungary did, many people in former Yugoslavia did. Uh, so some people in Eastern Europe say, okay, we talk a lot about the crisis in Southern Europe, in Ireland, in Iceland, but this is actually the impact in East Central Europe in some ways has been much deeper uh, than in many uh, Southern European countries. So uh, basically the problem that happened in Southern Europe was repeated in Eastern Europe. So you could say Southern Europe was included in the Euro, and therefore this technique didn't make sense anymore in Southern Europe. But then you get Eastern Europe to be part of the EU, but not part of the Euro yet, and you get the same thing being repeated. So Miriam Gunnemander, one of my former PhD students who worked on Poland and Russia, uh, she showed that uh, these several peripheral countries within Eastern Europe in this case are absorbing <coughs> globally mobile capital from the core. And this leads to a new kind of spatial fix of which these kind of mortgages are one very specific element. It's not just a consequence of it, it's one element in this system, which in a way is not something new because we already had it in an earlier period of time. Um, and then after 2007, we see a wider recycling of liquidity to underpin our ownership and mortgage programs in middle income countries. So I'm not saying what we saw here was just happening because we have a top-down movement, as it seems to be here, from monetary policies to something else. Actually, this was being used to support existing programs in many of those countries um, that were there to support home ownership, but many, in effect, were either mortgage programs or they were construction programs. And again, Brazil is heavily researched on this. Uh, and a few years ago, I started realizing that a lot of my citations of my research were coming from Brazil, either in English or in Portuguese. Uh, and I wanted to understand what was going on, so that's one of the reasons that I've been focusing on Brazil. I wanted to know why people pick up on my work so well there, compared to any other country. Um, so in Brazil, this really happened in, in this kind of way. We know it also, as I said, works for Turkey quite well. For Thailand, Indonesia, we see similar things going on. For South Africa and China, some of the elements of the story work there. Other elements of our story don't fit as much. So we're not saying this is the same everywhere, but it works for countries in very different parts of the world. Latin America, you could say Middle East, Turkey, or European periphery, uh, and then Southeast Asia as well. Uh, so the example of Brazil, and this is where I get close uh, to finalizing also, it shows a rapid growth of market lending, a growth of securitization. Yes, securitization in Brazil is very small, but it's growing quite rapidly. Real estate investment trusts are also growing rapidly, and as I showed earlier, in 1993 they already legalized REITs in Brazil, much earlier than most of Europe. Uh, and one important thing is also the lending is increasing to more income groups. So in many countries we see uh, lending increasing to middle income groups. In Brazil it's also being extended to low income groups, which in not all countries is the case. So in that sense there's a parallel with subprime lending, although it's not the same as subprime. Uh, then we see the central bank sterilizing, but actually some of this money the central banks sterilize is then being recycled again and goes into mortgages. So not because monetary policies of quantitative easing from the global north push Brazil to do the mortgages, it pushes the Brazilian central bank to take some of the finance going to private bonds out of circulation, but then the central bank 
is being able to retail that money for the policy goals of the government and for different consecutive governments of different political colors to put them into mortgages. So in a way, it's, it's an accident waiting to happen, but it's also something that they didn't foresee, this money going into private bonds, actually makes it easier to uh, implement some of the federal, federal policies. So many of you here in the room will know about Mia Casa Mia Fida, which is possibly the largest housing construction and uh, housing finance scheme in the world ever done. I haven't found anything bigger in China, but I'm happy to be convinced by anyone in China that there is something bigger there. But anywhere else, I haven't seen something like that. So the goal is to have 27 million new housing units, uh, and they're being rolled out as a subsidy program to construction firms, as Le Gaudonik and others have argued. Um, but it's also being rolled out as a mortgage subsidy program. Um, so it's home ownership for those formally excluded from it. A lot of people who were living in the favelas are being moved into these places. Uh, there's also cases, especially for Rio de Janeiro, where it shows the program is being used to enable things like um, the World Championship Football or uh, the Olympic Games, the locations where these things take place, some of them were favelas, and to move people out, it's easier if you have this program already in place. So you could also say it's a gentrification and demolishment program at the same time. So there's many things at the same time, and many of the mortgages come from a state institution. There's few countries where so many of the mortgages actually come from a quasi-federal state institution, which is also a quasi-pension fund. So again, very complicated, but they are the biggest mortgage lender in Brazil. They're also the biggest um, organization um, financing real estate development. Uh, so what we see here is that this large scheme is not being enabled necessarily or the consequence of these monetary policies, but they become easier to implement because all this money was flowing but Brazil had to take out, the Brazilian National Bank had to take out some of the money of one part of the economy to be able to reach out somewhere else. So what we see is that, yes, the financialization of housing is different in core and semi-periphery countries, but it's not unrelated. The crisis has effects on how this rolls out in different countries. Quantitative easing does, money flows do. Uh, but in the end, this global hierarchy of money is very difficult to find. So we could say that supported financialization, if we want to use that term, is a contemporary form of uneven and combined financialization. And these practices of financialization can coexist in otherwise non-financialized countries. Um, as I said, in Brazil there's other uh, practices. Uh, for instance, in the urban operation program, they use financial derivatives uh, for urban redevelopment that are also uh, more sophisticated financial products than anything I've seen, for instance, in the UK or the US. So in that sense, also, they are little islands of financialization. But these become launching grounds for financialization of the wider economy, as becoming clear also in places like Turkey and Brazil, extending to different sectors, different places, and also different classes of people. And this doesn't happen in, in ways that you can easily say, like, oh, it's more like it goes in one direction, then it goes in another one, it stops, it goes back a little bit, it goes further again. It's a very messy process. It's not a very easy process to just say, like, oh, we always see it. Uh, and of course, these kind of studies should be extended beyond mortgage debt. As I said at the beginning, rental housing is a very important element. I said that REITs increase in Brazil, I didn't really show it. And it should be uh, complemented by more country-specific studies. I now just use Brazil as a very brief uh, illustration of my argument, rather than making the full argument about it. Thank you very much.